This video is sponsored by Hone. As Germany was inevitably losing its grip during the last stages of World War II, it was also in the midst of developing the turbojet, a leading-edge technology far ahead from what other countries were building. However, as the war ended and the Third Reich fell, they were forced to abandon their projects, and all their technological advancements were seized by the victors. During the following years, the engineering legacy of the former superpower would shape the world in ways that not even Adolf Hitler could have imagined, especially as it was one of his greatest enemies that would benefit the most from this knowledge, the Soviets. As the British eventually fabricated their own jet and the Americans were near, the Soviet Union did not want to stay behind and worked with several firms to create the first Soviet jet fighter. The Yakovlev 15 was then born, but its place in history would be decided by the toss of a coin. We want to thank Hone Health for sponsoring Dark Skies. As YouTubers, brainstorming, creating, editing, and releasing new content takes a lot of energy and focus, and it becomes more difficult to find the necessary energy and focus the older you get. Millions of men like us can experience low hormone levels, leading to those feelings of fatigue and an inability to concentrate. Thankfully, Hone is here to help. Hone is the premier men's health clinic that treats men's hormone imbalances and low testosterone by providing access to at-home lab assessments, consultations with real physicians, and FDA-approved methods of treatment, all from the comfort of your home. Its treatments are backed by science, and Hone only offers products and treatments that are prescribed by a physician who consults with you via telehealth. We appreciate how the whole process is completed entirely online. Much like our work on YouTube, we are always thinking about how we can optimize our minds and bodies. Although we are not medical experts, Hone Health is, and they'll be with you every step of the way on your journey of discovery and personal optimization. Take the first step and order Hone's easy-to-use at-home assessment test today to learn your testosterone levels. For a limited time only, Dark Skies viewers get the at-home assessment and a doctor consultation for only $45. Click the link in the description below or go to honehealth.com slash darkskies to take advantage of this offer now. Beginning of an era, as Nazi Germany was falling in early 1945, the Allied countries significantly benefited from the decaying nation's scientific and military progress. Just like the Western Allies, the Soviet Union was after tantalizing pieces of captured data, especially those regarding the innovative turbojet engine technology marking the dawn of the jet era. The victors not only obtained invaluable information from the German facilities, but they also seized actual engines netted in abandoned storage buildings. This state-of-the-art technology could be tested and reverse-engineered, and soon the world's superpowers would use the German advances to further develop their own technology. The Soviets had already strived to create their own jet engine program, but their technology remained unproven. Meanwhile, the Americans were in the midst of several breakthroughs, but it was the British who were far ahead of the curve. Consequently, Soviet Premier Joseph Stalin favored the use of the captured engines to boost the introduction of new Soviet fighter jets until their own technology caught up. The Junkers Jumo 004B series German turbojet engine led the post-propeller era, and the Soviets amassed them in large numbers and sent them to several firms across the nation. The engineers were then tasked to build the first Soviet jet fighter. Then, in April of 1945, weeks before the fall of Berlin, the Council of People's Commissars instructed the Yakovlev Design Bureau, OKB, to devise a jet fighter with a single seat and a single engine, using the Yumo 004. The Soviet team based their new model on the previously successful Yak-3, and although the latter was a piston engine fighter, it would provide a consistent basis to build upon. Design and Development The Soviet Yak-3 had been in service during the war and was readily accessible. A conventional fighter in many ways, it had a fielding low-set monoplane wing ahead of amidships and featured a single-seat cockpit with sufficient all-around views. In addition, its traditional empennage showcased a short vertical fin with horizontal tailplanes. The first step was to remove the aircraft's piston engine, which was forward-mounted. Instead, the new turbo engine was fitted underneath the forward fuselage, which required a significant modification of the airframe. The exhaust would exit in the middle of the airframe, and thus a heat shield forged in steel needed to be added to the bottom of the fuselage to protect it from the outburst. Simultaneously, the three-bladed propeller was swapped for a gaping air intake needed to aspirate the new engine. 
Also, the thicker forward section of the aircraft now resembled a pod and boom, but other than the changes made to the nose, few modifications were made to the rest of the metal fuselage. An additional fuel tank was placed above the engine, and the airframe had to be recontoured to accommodate the new armament, two 23mm Noodleman Surinav NS-23 autocannons. The wings mostly remained the same, although the air intakes for the oil cooler were eliminated and the front wing spar was bent, now positioned as an inverted U-shape to clear the engine. Also, while the vertical stabilizer was slightly enlarged, the tailplanes were unmodified. Finally, the aft end of the fuselage was kept intact, along with the conventional tail-dragging undercarriage to expedite development. Only the tail wheel was modified, now equipped with several steel leaf springs as shock absorbers. The end result was a light airframe, which combined well with the underperforming JU-004B. The model was able to carry 590 kilograms of fuel. Initial testing. In October of 1945, the Yak Yumo began carrying out taxi tests. At first, the heat shield proved too short, as the heat melted the duralumin skin of the rear fuselage, not to mention the rubber tire of the tail wheel. Further modifications delayed the aircraft's development until late December. By then, the second prototype was ready, featuring a solid steel wheel and an enlarged tailplane. After passing its initial taxiing tests, the prototype was sent to the Central Aerohydrodynamic Institute, where it underwent full-scale wind tunnel trials until February of 1946. Later that month, the Council of People's Commissars issued specific requirements for the aircraft, indicating that it had to achieve a maximum speed of 770 km per hour at sea level and 850 km per hour at an altitude of 5,000 meters. Moreover, the aircraft needed to climb to that altitude in four and a half minutes or less, and it needed to reach 500 kilometers at 90% of its maximum speed. The Council demanded two prototypes. The First Soviet Jet Fighter While the Yak Yuma was being developed, Mikoyan Guryevich was working on its own turbojet fighter, the MiG-9. According to reports, representatives from both firms tossed a coin on April 24, 1946, to decide which model would be the first Soviet jet to fly, and Yakovlev lost. The MiG-9 then flew first, and the Yak Yumo followed minutes later. After its first flight, the aircraft received the official designation of Yak-15. The aircraft had such an excellent performance that five days after its maiden flight, the Council of Ministers issued a new requirement for two models. However, this time, they would be powered by the newly Soviet-built RD-10 turbojet. Additional changes included an augmented range of 700 kilometers at optimum cruise speed and a reduced maximum ceiling of 14,000 meters. Two prototypes were to be available by September 1st. Further flight testing took place through June, and the two prototypes were adapted for the RD-10 by August. That same month, the Yak-15 was publicly displayed during the Tushino Aviation Day. The following day, Stalin had both Artem Mikoyan and Alexander Yakovlev come to his office and ordered 15 aircraft from each company. The fleet was to participate in the October Revolution Anniversary Parade in the Red Square on November 7th. Given that Yak-3s were still being built at Factory No. 31 in Tbilisi, the factories could easily switch to the new model and were therefore selected to produce the first batch. The 15 aircraft were ready before the deadline, although they were not fitted with any armor and their avionics outfit was incomplete. In fact, the fleet was delivered with an enhanced fuel tank instead of the armament. However, the parade was cancelled shortly after, and two of the aircraft were then equipped with a single 23mm cannon to begin state acceptance trials immediately. Operational History After an evaluation period that lasted until April of 1947, several problems with the aircraft were revealed. The Yak-3's thick wing limited the new version's top speed. In addition, the exhaust damaged the airfield's surface, and the cockpit would often fill with smoke from kerosene and oil spills from the engine. Also, its range was less than ideal. Despite all of these problems, the Yak-15 was very easy to fly, even for pilots unfamiliar with jet engines. Thus, the Soviet Air Force decided to accept the Yak-15 as a conversion trainer. The aircraft was then rushed into production in December of 1946, even before the acceptance trials were completed. The first batch of 50 single-seaters eventually participated in the May Day fly-past in Moscow in 1947. By the time the aircraft entered military service, it was finally formally armed. 
It was initially equipped with a pair of 20mm BM-20 series cannons, but they were later changed for the Noodleman Cernov series, mounted on the upper forward nose assembly. Each cannon was allocated 60 projectiles of ammunition. The Yak-15 was delivered throughout late 1947, with 280 examples, not counting the prototypes. Its NATO codename was Feather, given that Soviet fighters would be designated with F names and bombers with B names. They were then distributed to regiments across the USSR, in Poland, Romania, Hungary, and Manchuria. Apart from its primary use as a conversion trainer, the Yak-15 was also used by several informal acrobatic display teams in the late 1940s. As for the trainer version, the Yak-21 featured a lengthened fuselage with two redundant seats and flight controls for the instructor and the trainee. The training process was thorough, as the new jet-powered capabilities brought about unknown aspects of aviation, regardless of piloting experience. However, further work on the trainer was cancelled in favor of the Yak-17, which would employ the RD-10 engine and improved aerodynamics. This version would resemble the original, but have redesigned wings, an enlarged tail structure, and a new ejection seat. Plus, the canopy would now accommodate a new bulletproof windscreen, and the landing gear was redesigned to retract into the fuselage. Despite the expectations for the Yak-17 to outperform the original Yak-15, with a top speed of 822 kilometers per hour, it never flew, because the former had already been ordered into production. Ultimately, the Yak-15 was only operated by the Soviet Union, had a short service life, and was never available in quantity to be exported to any allies. However, the first-generation Soviet turbojet fighter played a key role in the age of the jet, and provided the gateway for more advanced jet types, such as the MiG-15, which was critical in the Korean War. Thank you for watching our video. If you enjoyed it, please hit the like button. And don't forget to subscribe to all our Dark Documentaries channels for more fascinating aviation stories from the world wars.